It has a, it's going to tell us today about the, her updates in, in the best of DDW in regards to IBD. So I'm going to invite Sarah up to the floor. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me here today. Um, it's fun to have Eric introducing me. Um, being co-fellows together is always fun. Um, and so my goals for today are to go over some of the highlights uh, from DDW this past year um, with regard to IBD. So there were a few questions that um, were addressed with some high quality abstracts that I wanted to review. So as far as, let's see, questions that were answered. Um, question number one is, what is in the drug development pipeline for IBD? Question two, sorry, this, uh, uh, is what agent should I choose for my patient with Crohn's disease? Question three, does switching between biosimilars affect clinical outcomes? Question four, does ustekinumab treat extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease? Question five, does corticosteroid use in pregnancy affect pregnancy and neonatal outcomes? And question six, what should I tell my Crohn's disease patients to eat? So for this first question about what's in the drug development pipeline, this is kind of a, a chart that I like to lay out in terms of all the different mechanisms and drugs that are now um, available or are currently in development for inflammatory bowel disease. So the ones that are in large font and are bolded are ones that are currently FDA approved. Um, ones that are in smaller print are those that are currently in development. And I'll go over a couple of uh, data points and abstracts that were presented for some of these agents. So for um, the JAK inhibitors, of course, we have tofacitinib that's already FDA approved, but filgotinib did, um, was also presented at DDW, which is a specific JAK inhibitor. Uh, and uh, there was phase two data looking at specifically safety, um, which showed that there was no significant adverse safety events. So we'll look forward to the phase three trials for that. Um, the other new kid on the block, of course, are the S1P modulators. Ozanamod was just FDA approved in the last month for ulcerative colitis. Um, and so we'll look ahead to other S1P modulators in the pipeline, but there was no other uh, abstracts of note that were presented at DDW this year. There was a lot of activity looking at the selective IL-23 agents. Um, both rizinkizumab and gesulcimab had phase two efficacy data that uh, were presented in abstracts this year, um, both showing excellent efficacy compared to placebo. And mirakizumab also had phase two safety data that was presented that um, showed a good safety profile. So these are some of the new drugs in the pipeline to be looking out for, and we'll look ahead to the phase three trials of some of these smaller font agents. In terms of the next question, which is what agent should I choose for my patient with Crohn's disease, there were a number of high quality comparative effectiveness trials that were presented at DDW. Uh, first off was a comparative effectiveness trial that was put out by Ryan Angaro's group at Mount Sinai, looking at the difference between adalimumab and vetalizumab as a first-line therapy for Crohn's disease. This used a commercial claims database and used a propensity score matching design to answer the question about whether um, particular clinical outcomes, namely hospitalizations, ER visits, and the ability to discontinue corticosteroids was uh, greater in one group versus the other. And so I'll go over a couple of slides from their uh, presentation. So it's a little bit small, these uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, graphs here, but you can see here that this is for all-cause inpatient admission and that vetalizumab, uh, vetalizumab was associated with higher rates of all-cause inpatient admissions as well as for Crohn's disease-related admissions. And so the study authors concluded that adalimumab was associated with less healthcare utilization as patients were also less likely to visit the emergency room or to be hospitalized after induction. Another point that came out of this abstract that was presented was that adalimumab seemed to be associated with sooner and higher rates of 
corticosteroid discontinuation. So adalimumab is this higher, uh, higher blue line here with vetalizumab being the green line here, showing that the percentage of patients in the study that had corticosteroid uh, discontinuation um, was ultimately a higher rate as well as you can see this curve as well as a steeper curve that patients were able to discontinue uh, the corticosteroids sooner. And so with this, the study authors concluded that adalimumab is also associated with uh, being able to discontinue steroids earlier and more often. Um, the next study looked that was a high quality comparative effectiveness study was looking at vetalizumab and ustekinumab, and this was the Venus study, which came out of a group from France, um, was looking at vetalizumab and ustekinumab for Crohn's disease in anti-TNF exposed patients. Um, this was from a pharmacy database and it used match propensity score design as, again, so similar design to the study I just presented previously. And what this demonstrated is that corticosteroid-free remission at week 14 and 24 um, were similar between the ustekinumab and vetalizumab groups. However, um, and you can see that here with you know, these high p-values. However, in the, at, by week 54, there was a slight statistical difference between the ustekinumab group with about 50% with corticosteroid-free remission versus vetalizumab, which is about 40% corticosteroid-free remission um, at week 54. And this was statistically significant with a p-value squeaking in at 0.047. And so the authors concluded that corticosteroid-free remission at week 54 was greater in the ustekinumab group compared to vetalizumab. However, there was no difference earlier on in that first year um, that was seen. Um, and I think another important point is this is an anti-TNF experienced group, uh, both of these, uh, both groups. And so that 50% and 40% corticosteroid free remission at 54 weeks is actually quite high. And so I think noting that both seem to be effective. Last but not least, the kind of blockbuster comparative effectiveness trial that was presented as a late-breaking abstract was the CVU study comparing ustekinumab versus adalimumab for Crohn's disease. And this was a multi-center, randomized, uh, blinded trial looking at biologic naive patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Um, patients were randomized either to ustekinumab with sham injections or adalimumab with sham infusion. And this was the first head-to-head -head study of biologics in patients with Crohn's disease. I think we've been hungry for a long time for these comparative effectiveness trials um, and head-to-head -head studies. And this, similar to the Varsity study that looked at vetalizumab and adalimumab, um, this was meant to be the kind of Crohn's answer to that study design. What this study found um, is that both ustekinumab and adalimumab were highly effective for treatment in a, in a biologic naive patient with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. And the numbers that came out of this included 61% had a clinical remission characterized by a CDAI score less than 150 um, in the adalimumab group compared to 65% in the ustekinumab group. And then a secondary endpoint of corticosteroid-free remission at week 52, 57.4% in adalimumab group and 60% in the ustekinumab group. And so compared to um, the, this is you know, quite excellent for this biologic naive group, you know, seeing 40% in an anti-TNF experienced group, but still 60% corticosteroid-free remission is, is quite excellent for both agents. So to summarize this very important question that comes up a bit, uh, quite a bit, is which agent should we use and how should we position these agents? It appears that both adalimumab and ustekinumab are good choices for biologic naive patients. Um, adalimumab and ustekinumab are associated with improved outcomes compared to vetalizumab, but we don't have that same head-to-head -head trial that uh, we had seen with the CVU study looking at adalimumab and ustekinumab. So this is an association and not sort of an ironclad um, rule of thumb just yet. So the next question that I wanted to address that came up as an abstract at DDW this year was, does switching between biosimilars of, infliximab, uh, of infliximab affect clinical outcomes? So this was a prospective observational study coming out of Scandinavia looking at um, switching from infliximab biosimilars uh, uh, from one type to another. 
And what it demonstrated is that there was no difference in clinical or biochemical remission between baseline and at week 26 after the switch. So it seems that, again, similar to originator infliximab and um, switching to a biosimilar not having any difference, that switching among or between biosimilars does not seem to affect clinical outcomes. Additionally, they also looked at those who did a double switch from originator infliximab to some of the other uh, bio, biosimilars, and even doing a double switch, again, did not seem to impact clinical outcomes. So I know there was a lot of angst and anxiety about what it would mean to switch patients from the sort of originator drug to these biosimilars, but I think again and again we are seeing that really no difference is, uh, has been seen. The next question that uh, was brought up in a high quality abstract was this question of whether ustekinumab will, is able to treat extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease. Um, and so this was a retrospective study that looked at um, individuals started um, with, uh, on ustekinumab therapy for Crohn's and noted response rates of extra intestinal manifestations and noted that approximately two thirds of patients um, did have a good response of their extra intestinal manifestations. Um, not surprisingly, those who had resolution of extra intestinal manifestations also were those who had a good clinical response for their Crohn's disease. The next question that came up is how does steroid use affect pregnancy? And so this is a, uh, a study that came out of the piano registry by Dr. Mahadevan at UCSF. Um, and um, it's the piano registry is a prospective multicenter observational cohort study um, and looked specifically in this uh, abstract that was presented at corticosteroid use among pregnant women. And what the uh, abstract presented showed that IBD was associated with an increased uh, corticosteroid use in IBD pregnancy was associated with an increased risk of low birth weight, preterm birth, NICU stay at birth, and congenital malformations when first trimester exposure occurred. And so I think one question that came up quite a bit with this abstract is how can you really control for disease activity is really active disease um, really what's contributing and causing some of these associations. Um, but they did a lot of um, statistical work to try to control for that as best as possible. And so the authors um, of this abstract concluded that really the goal is to control disease very well and tightly before conception, and that to be aggressive for use of steroid sparing agents during pregnancy rather than letting patients linger on corticosteroids um, should really be the goal for uh, the care of the uh, pregnant IBD patient and those uh, that are considering conception. The last uh, ab abstract that I wanted to review is about what we should tell our Crohn's patients to eat. So this is something that comes up quite a bit. What should I eat to control my inflammatory bowel disease? And for a long time, there's been interest in what's called the specific carbohydrate diet, um, as well as the Mediterranean diet. And this was a study that compared, um, was called the DYNE-CD study, that compared uh, randomized patients either to the SCD diet or the Mediterranean diet and followed their both clinical and biochemical outcomes. The specific carbohydrate diet is more restrictive. It avoids grains, most dairy, and any sweeteners other than honey, including a lot of naturally occurring sweeteners that occur in foods. Whereas the Mediterranean diet really is focused more on limiting the intake of red and processed meats and other processed foods, including um, sort of sweets and things along those lines, but it has more, um, it's a more liberal diet. And in this study, they noted that for symptomatic remission, clinical remission, fecal calprotectin response, and CRP, that there was no statistically significant difference among the, uh, between the SCD and the Mediterranean diet groups. However, I think it's important to recognize that there's good symptomatic response and actually clinical remission of what patients were reporting being on these diets, but the fecal calprotectin response, and really notably the CRP response, was actually quite poor in terms of the difference that was noted at the beginning of this diet trial um, towards the end. So patients may feel a lot better with these diet changes, but may not necessarily completely heal them or move the needle. The takeaway, though, I think, though, is that if patients are asking, what should I be eating, the specific carbohydrate diet was not superior to the Mediterranean diet. And so both diet, and so I think really, if we have to make a recommendation about one or over the other, it does not seem that the 
SED has any advantages that we could glean from this study. Both diets were well tolerated despite both having increased fruit and vegetable intake. And a lot of patients with Crohn's, I think, are counseled to be on low residue diets, avoid fruits and vegetables, and there were no adverse events um, in either of these groups despite increasing their uh, fruit and vegetable intake. So just to summarize the answers to some of the questions that were brought up at DDW this year. What's in the drug development pipeline for IBD? For phase two efficacy, we saw good results for rizinkizumab and gesulcumab, which are selective IL-23 agents. Good safety data for filgotinib, which is a JAK, selective JAK inhibitor, and mirkizumab, an IL-23 agent. For which agent we should choose for our patient with Crohn's. Adalimumab and ustekinumab both seem to be effective for Crohn's disease and potentially have better outcomes compared to vetalizumab, but head-to-head -head trials are needed. Switching biosimilars does not seem to affect clinical outcomes. Ustekinumab does seem to treat extra-intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease. Steroid use in pregnancy does affect pregnancy and neonatal, out neonatal outcomes adversely, and we should really work on controlling the disease before pregnancy starts and to aggressively use steroid sparing agents during flares in pregnancy. And lastly, what should we tell our Crohn's patients to eat? The Mediterranean diet and SED were equivalent, and veggies and fruits are well tolerated. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for their time, and I look forward to taking your questions at the end of the session. Great job, Sarah. Thanks so much. You learned so much today. Uh, my name is Michael Alper, and I would like to present today Walter Park. And uh, Walter is an associate professor of medicine at Stanford University and medical director of the Benign Pancreas Program at Stanford Healthcare. He completed his medical education at John 